Hey, how you doing? You doing good? I really hope so. Listen, I did not finish WandaVision. Call me a punk, call me an idiot, call me a hack, but it wasn't for me. It started out for me, then went in a direction that wasn't for me, and I started rewatching Gotham instead. I did not love Far From Home. Broke me. I did not love Endgame. Damn. I did not love Infinity War, and I did not love Thor Ragnarok, and I don't remember dick about Captain Marvel or Ant-Man the Wasp. Pun, pun, well. Well. Honestly, the MCU and I have not been on the same wavelength since my dead, decrepit soul was blessed by Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. So I did not expect to vibe with, to love, or to feel much of anything when it came to the Falcon and the Winter Soldier. The trailer made it look like more of the same, you know what I mean. The trailer made it look like a dumb, goofy, fun buddy cop show with two pre-established supporting characters being stuck together for our comedic enjoyment. In the great words of Spike Lee, it very much did not look like my cup of tea. But I ain't gonna lie and say that I wasn't curious about it, wasn't intrigued from afar, because to me, this show had a hard task, maybe the trickiest one that Marvel Studios has undertaken in a while. The Falcon and the Winter Soldier had to make the Falcon and the Winter Soldier real characters. The Falcon and the Winter Soldier had to make Sam Wilson and Bucky Barnes real human beings. And as I joyously tweeted out as soon as I watched the first episode, holy fuck, Falcon and the Winter Soldier is my favorite MCU thing in years. Vulnerable and human. Loved it. So yeah, Falcon and the Winter Soldier is my favorite MCU thing in years. It's vulnerable and human, and I loved it. But before we dive into Birdman and depress Bucky the Snowman, I'd like to give a big old thanks to Babbel for sponsoring this video. For those of you who don't know, Babbel is the number one language learning app in the world, with more than 10 million subscriptions worldwide. What sets Babbel apart from the other online learning language platforms is that their lessons are actually built by 150 plus real life language teachers, whereas other apps use creepy machine learning AI technology. F*** the machines. I was shocked, flabbergasted to learn that you only need about 10 to 15 minutes of lessons per day to see results within three weeks. It's so easy to fit into any busy schedule. They even have a feature called Babbel Live, where you can join a live class online for an additional fee. So take a break from watching my shitty videos, and I'll take a break from making them, please. And we can both improve our minds, our memories, our souls, and grow and be productive by learning a new language. J'adore Sam Raimi, c'est une légion, mais je mets des tests, s'il te plaît, essaie Babbel. And right now, Babbel is a very special promotion for you. If you buy a six month subscription, you'll get an additional six months for fucking free. And your first lesson is always free. So if you want to get a head start on learning a new language, or if you just want to brush up on a language you already know, click on my link in the description. You'll be supporting the channel and learning a fantastic skill. Thanks, guys. Let's be real here. You hopefully know me well enough by now. If not, check out the High Top Cast now on Spotify to know that as soon as they showed Sam Wilson getting denied alone and Bucky Barnes having PTSD, having so much self-hatred that he tortures himself by having his only real world human connection be the father of someone he brutally murdered as the Winter Soldier that I was gonna fuck with this show. I mean, I could make this entire video about how cool it is that the MCU is finally giving us a relatable hero who has financial trouble, two relatable people who have real world problems, who struggle with their mental health, who struggle to do the right thing for the world, who struggle to do what's right for themselves. <laughs> I can't really thank Marvel or the mouse for that though. <laughs> it's funny because that scene and that moment ended up triggering everybody at Marvel. We were getting calls from Kevin, from Lou, from from Victoria, from Nate, like everyone in Marvel wanted input there. I could make an entire damn video on the first episode where in just 40 minutes, we finally get to actually know and understand these two characters who have been around, been on the big screen for over half a fucking decade. There's a reason Bucky and Sam don't meet up until the second episode because we need to understand Bucky and Sam before they can try to understand each other. We need to finally know about Bucky's family. We need to see Sam's family. We need to know what these two do, what they did when they weren't serving Steve's narrative and the MCU's ongoing story. And by the end of that first 40, we do understand, we do empathize. It's kind of incredible how efficiently and naturally the creators make us feel for them through something as simple as a battleship game or a family talk or an intense therapy session. It's kind of incredible just how focused on character Falcon and the Winter Soldier is. They could have easily opened the whole show on Falcon flying around with the slick little wings and a slick little action sequence. Instead, 
We open on a man ironing a shirt, getting ready to make a hard choice, facing the legacy of his friend and the responsibility that friend thrusted upon him. This is the benefit of having a six hour movie compared to a two hour movie. You can hold on a face, you can hold on an emotion, you can see the vulnerabilities of someone who would be two dimensional with only two hours. A feeling can last an eternity. The weight of their journey is not undermined by the need to cut to the next grand bit of spectacle. Sebastian Stan and Anthony Mackie finally get a chance to really dive deep into the truths of these characters, explore and showcase the beauty of these characters, and we are given enough time to see that beautifully honest truth. These MCU miniseries, these six-hour movies, have the potential to be more storyteller-driven, more creative, more impactful than their theatrically released films. The filmmaking and creative choices on display have the time to feel more thought out, more genuine. Falcon and Winter Soldier takes the Russo-style handheld grounded filmmaking vibe and instills it with color, dramatic lighting, and most importantly, purpose. It's more than an aesthetic choice that semi-syncs up with the look of Civil War and Winter Soldier. It's the best way to visually tell this story. Constant claustrophobic camera angles and shots are utilized to immediately reattach us to these characters. They're invasive, a therapy conversation feels too close, especially when you're lying. Making a speech in Washington while the whole world watches every blink, every step, every word and choice you make feels almost haunting. Throughout the entire series, we feel that pressure. We feel like we're watching two outsiders in their most private moments. And maybe we shouldn't be. Maybe we're crossing a boundary that these characters don't want us to. When Bucky finally makes the choice to step through the glass he's been frozen behind most of his life, maybe we shouldn't follow him. Maybe we should just allow him to have this moment of peace. And as the show progresses, as we grow closer to these people, the camera warms up, just as the characters do. What was an invasion now feels like warm intimacy. The shot composition, the camera movement, the visual language here is a huge step forward from the recent Marvel films, and it'd be ridiculous and entirely unfair of me not to point out how well and how purposeful the visuals are in telling this story. You can also tell that getting a director like Kari Skoglund, who has worked in the comic book world, the prestige television world for over a decade, was beyond the right move. It feels like she knows exactly the vision she and showrunner Malcolm Spell men want to achieve. It feels like she knows exactly how to get there and do it with style. It has the most tactile, crafted by hand, down to earth and shot on location feel since the first act of Civil War. It's kind of amazing how effective a simple moment of a superhero just saving people in New York City can be. When we're so used to armies of gods, soldiers and warriors charging in a swarm of aliens led by a purple god wielding magic fucking space rocks. It's amazing how fuzzy, how childlike I felt watching these two characters try to save human beings and not a universe. I guess when you scale it down, when you boil it back to basics, I feel that early MCU magic that I thought had faded away long ago. So many times I got a little taste of the goosebumps, of the nostalgia, of the excitement just from hearing Henry Jackman's Captain America themes come back here, be remixed here, and recontextualized. So many times I was shocked at how violent, raw, and done for real the action was. I was ready to nitpick. I was ready to be like, it ain't Daredevil. And while it's still very much ain't Daredevil, it's a step in the right direction. Well, it's a step in my kind of direction. And fuck me, dude. Even when we do get the standard Marvel fare, it's done with a lot more flair and a lot more visual punch. I guess I'm just happy to be enjoying something in this universe that I thought I was numb to. It's a great feeling to once again love something that defines find a large part of my childhood. Is it perfect? Nah, but nothing is. The plot, the bits where our heroes aren't fixing up a damn boat or just, you know, talking, but are actually facing the flag smashers feels kind of empty. I knew what they wanted. I knew and understood why they wanted it, but I genuinely had no clue what their grandmaster plan was half the time. It felt like it shifted episode to episode. Maybe something was cut out, rewritten at the last second, or maybe I really just am an idiot.
But with that lack of focus on the physical conflict, we get more time for more character work, which makes me a very happy guy. The characters are never in service to the plot, to the world building narrative. Those things are entirely in service of Sam and Bucky, developing Sam and Bucky. Does Zemo really need to be here? Does he really add anything to the story of the show? irresistible no but what he does do is serve bucky what he does do is provide bucky a chance a chance to let go of vengeance to show us how far he has come to show us him choosing to let go of violence Honestly, though, my biggest issues stem not even from Falcon and the Winter Soldier itself, really, but from how the previous film set up Falcon and Winter Soldier. Steve and Bucky's goodbye and endgame felt hollow to me. We missed a conversation, a final farewell between two best friends, two brothers that was only implied. The central physical conflict revolves around the real world implications of the snap. The five years where the world fundamentally changed, so many died, so many were left behind. That's some serious shit, and that serious shit is played seriously here, given real consequences and impact, which is fan-fucking-tastic, but I couldn't forget that less than five years ago, Broke Me From Home handled the five years the snap the blip as if it were some kind of comedic gag. The blip. Sharon coming back and being rightfully pissed at the Avengers that Steve kind of forgot about her after she essentially sacrificed her career, her life, feels like a direct response to the films forgetting about her. Her turning out to be the power broker feels like the only thing they thought they could do with her character. It's a complete 180 character change from the kind woman who looked up to her fearless and endlessly sacrificing aunt to a cold exploitative villain. And it's all kind of Steve's fault. It's kind of the previous film's fault for forgetting or just not knowing what to do with the character. You get what I'm getting at? But can I really hold all that against Falcon and Winter Soldier? Against what the storytellers are now trying to do? Hell no. And what they are trying to do is ask questions. Winter Soldier and Civil War raised various political and social questions about our modern world, but then never really answered them and instead went boom, boom, stork, boom. And I was worried this would be another case of that. I was worried they would half-assedly resolve Isaiah Bradley's struggling and ignore the serious and powerful implications of his story. But the final episode solidifies that Falcon and Winter Soldier wants to actively question the system with as much authenticity as you could possibly get with a Disney-produced billion-dollar superhero streaming service property of a corporate machine. It's shockingly sincere in its execution and never apologizes for it. They will never let a black man be Captain America. And you're gonna have a bunch of middle-aged dudes screaming about how bad this kind of writing is. But fuck that, man. It ain't about that. It ain't about their opinions or mine. What the fuck do we matter? It's about this. It's about a young kid seeing this. It's about a young kid seeing himself as someone who could be Captain America, and it's about earning that. It's not as simple, and it shouldn't be as simple as being handed a shield. It should be and is about discovering what it means to be Captain America. Every character in the Falcon and the Winter Soldier is compared to the idea of Captain America to Steve Rogers. John and Lamar are what the government wants Captain America to be. They have the with the program attitude and the physical aptitude to be a great symbol of change and a symbol of America. Isaiah Bradley is the sickening and terrifying truth of what the USA did as soon as the serum worked on Steve Rogers. It's taking someone those in power view as disposable and experimenting on them with hopes that they will be America's next super soldier. Steve never appears physically, but I would say America's desperate attempt to recreate him to live up to the legend is the true villain of the story. And our heroes have to face that. They have to fight America's capital. Captain America, they have to fight what the world wants them to be in order to become what they need to be. Bucky has fought for everyone else his entire life. He has been the world's killing machine. That metal arm is more than a tool. It's a physical representation of the violence and brutality that has defined the bulk of his life. And it's only after he beats America's soldier that he can let go of the Winter Soldier. Why didn't he use the metal arm? Well. I don't always think of it immediately, I'm right-handed. He can use that arm to save people. He can take control. He can choose to let that metal arm that has dragged him down lift those around him 
up. Just like Steve would have wanted for his brother. Because that's the thing, right? America misses the point of Captain America. They miss the point of Steve Rogers. Steve's gift wasn't his physical strength. It wasn't anything that came from the serum. It was not his ability to be a perfect soldier, but was his ability to no matter what, be a good man. No matter how many times he got knocked down, no matter how many times he was told he was wrong by the government, by his friends, no matter how many times he lost someone he loved, he always got back up. I know this all day. He always did what he believed was right. He always remained a kind, good-hearted, and caring hero who always remained that good man. And so is Sam. What would be the point of all the pain and sacrifice? if I wasn't willing to stand up and keep fighting. Sam Wilson has become the icon that Steve created through his heroism and through his selflessness. And Sam has evolved that icon for a modern age while honoring its original purpose. Captain America was always supposed to be the hope, the dream of what America can be and what a hero should be. Someone who questions the system while trying to change it through compassion. Someone who has empathy for those who are struggling, those who have been wronged. Captain America is doing the right thing. He's the idea of getting back up no matter how far you've fallen. He's the idea that we can grow. The only power I have is that I believe we can do better. And Sam is Captain America. The strength of Falcon and Winter Soldier, my favorite thing about Falcon and Winter Soldier is how it took the Falcon and the Winter Soldier, Sam and Bucky, two characters that were defined by Steve Rogers, and finally allowed them to define themselves. Listen, I could and gladly would watch six hours of Sam Wilson trying to fix his family's boat. And in a way, I did. That boat is the Wilson family legacy. Sam needs to fix it. Sam needs to make sure it can sail again. That shield is Steve's legacy. Bucky needs to make sure it lives on. Bucky needs to make sure it becomes the symbol of hope and perseverance again. And in the end, when all is said and when all is done, they both succeed in fixing, repairing, and maintaining their legacies. And that's not because of their strength, their guns, their wings, or their shields, but because of their will and their willingness to get back up and still be here. Because of their love and dedication to Steve, and now to each other. The Falcon and the Winter Soldier allowed these two, this odd couple of outsiders, to redefine what Captain America needs to be. Redefine what Captain America has to be.